Evening everybody, lovely to be with you again tonight as we come around the scriptures following our pattern of those Moravian daily texts. And um, tonight it's one of those quite large passages um, that just so happens to be absolutely jam-packed of things that really just leap off the page at us. And if you've read that, I'm sure you've found it to be the case. It's um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. So that, that second part of that chapter and through with chapter 2 up to verse 7 as well. So um, right at the outset, I think it's fair to say there's no way um, that I can possibly do this justice in a few short minutes. Um, but do please uh, comment, question along the way and offer your own insights and thoughts as we go. Doubtless, uh, together we'll get a lot further than we would apart from one another. Now, um, the, the first portion of, of, of what we have from verse 12 of chapter 1, it's teaching, but it's woven through with, with praise to God. Um, or most specifically, praise to Jesus Christ our Lord, who saves and appoints those he has saved to his service, uh, which is an incredible treasure. No wonder um, verse 17 concludes that portion with the words to the king of the ages immortal invisible the only god be honor and glory forever and ever amen god is good and if you know the, the saving work of jesus and if you've uh, experienced that commissioning of him in his work then then you would join with paul i'm sure in such a, a, a hymn of praise if you don't yet know the saving love of Jesus, um, if you haven't understood uh, the purpose of your life in serving God and his goodness in this world, then please do, do get in touch with us. We'd love to help you to explore that. Now, I've said already, it's way too expansive for us to really deep dive into everything that's going on here. Uh, but as I was reading through this, um, one perhaps thought kept on recurring to me, and that is we have to pay attention pay attention not only pay attention to the text but pay attention to what god is doing because we often ascribe motive and we think that there's a certain kind of purpose when what god is doing is actually sometimes coming from a different place and he's going to a different destination um what do i mean by this well that the first portion in as much as paul is praising god for salvation and commissioning in his service um he also makes plain that, the, that there are particular reasons. I guess when we think about the fact that we've been saved by the grace of God, saved from our sin and for his service, when we understand we've been saved from death to life, from darkness to light, we reflect upon this. There are many reasons why we might um, be thankful. We often tend towards thinking about God has saved us because he loves us. That's very true. Um, but there's perhaps a temptation in that to start to think of ourselves as being rather lovely then, isn't there? Um, well, what, what does Paul say are, are actually some of the motivations or the purposes in the work of salvation? Well, he says this. He says, um, you know, the, Paul says, though formerly, verse 13, I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent. It sounds a bit like some of the sins that he mentioned um, in the portion we looked at yesterday, doesn't it? He says, even though that was the case, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me. Now, what does he mean by this? Well, he doesn't mean that he gets off scot-free because he was ignorant. It's often said, isn't it, that ignorance of the law is no excuse within our kind of human natural laws. Um, and it's not the case that he just gets off scot-free because he was ignorant. Rather, what he's saying is, I was so ignorant, I had no means of saving myself, I needed a saviour. I needed to receive mercy because in my ignorance, all I could do was act in unbelief. Now, it's not God saved us because he loves us. God saved us because we're ignorant and incapable of bringing about anything other than uh, destruction upon ourselves. We need mercy. And secondly, um, he, he talks about his salvation in these terms, verse 16. Well, what's the reason? I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, what he means is the, the foremost, the chief of sinners, it's not a good thing, but as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience 
as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. It's really interesting, isn't it? Why has Jesus saved me? Because I was ignorant and incapable of saving myself. Why has he saved me? So that by displaying his mercy and his patience to me, he might also bring others to salvation. It's interesting ways of considering salvation, isn't it? So this is why I'm saying pay attention. Sometimes we just, we, we think we know. And in fact, we actually kind of minimize, diminish the fullness, the multifaceted wonder of what can be known and understood and lived out if we would only pay attention. Two other places where we can pay attention within this passage, where at face value we might be confused or assume we know, but if we pay attention, we'll see something else going on. The second place um, is this. Um, uh, there are a couple of people, Hymenius and Alexander. Hymenius is going to be mentioned again in Paul's next letter to Timothy alongside a guy called Philetus. Um, we don't know a huge amount about them, but we do know that they were the false teachers that Paul has been at pains to, to instruct Timothy to resist. Um, they've, um, by not holding fast to a good conscience, conscience in the faith, they've made a shipwreck of their faith. Um, but Paul says this about Hymenius and Alexander. I have handed them over to Satan. Wow, that's stark language, isn't it? Um, the, the terminology that's often used within church circles is the idea of excommunication. And, and I, I'm aware, um, I don't suppose it's ever been different, but certainly within our modern Western world, these things kind of sit ill at ease with us, don't they? Um, they kind of sit poorly with us. We feel like, well, who is he? Who is Paul to hand over someone to Satan? How do you even do that? Um, and is he just dismissing them? Is he rejecting them? Is he saying, well, you're done and dusted now. You're as good as you're as good as gone, as good as dead, as good as in judgment, um, even in hell. Um, is that what's happening here? Well, you know, if we allow our own kind of sense of self to kind of rankle against the justice that Paul is administering, then we might think that. But what does the text actually say? Pay attention. Um, I've handed them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Clearly that the false teaching they were offering Paul considered to be um, tantamount to blasphemy. Um, you know, really taking the Lord's name in vain, um, misrepresenting him and utilizing God for their own ill purposes. Couldn't really be anything worse. But what's Paul's intent for them? So that they may learn. So that there might be a, a point at which they could stop sinning and turn again. That they've been shipwrecked in their faith. But actually, uh, by allowing the consequence of that to play out, Paul is longing for them that they would actually have a, a, a repentance. Please God, come to a sense of belief. So I have to pay attention to what the text is really saying. Because... You know, if, if we are to um, have maybe brothers and sisters in the faith who, who blaspheme or turn away, what do we talk about yesterday? Backsliding. Uh, we don't want to kind of mollycoddle um, or pretend like it's not a big deal. I think it's a big deal to, to be called by God to hand over to Satan. Um, but no matter what God calls us to do, whether it's to persevere in prayer, whether it is to, to call someone out to repentance in loving Christian relationship, whether it's to walk alongside someone so that they would return or, or indeed to hand them over to the consequence of their action, whatever it might be, we need to pay attention to, to the goal that God has. And then lastly, um, here's another one that might sit ill with you. Um, now Paul says at the beginning of chapter two, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people. So far, so good. Um, I think we can all agree that praying for people is good. Um, I hope you can. Um, and, and, and this is part of God's desire that all should come to salvation. You know, everybody um, should be saved. But then Paul gets specific in a, a, perhaps an unusual or, or surprising way. He says, this prayer, he gets specific, should be made for kings, verse 2, and all who are in high positions. That's a tricky one. You know, we live in... Um, a world, or we live in a culture here in the, um, the United Kingdom. Um, the prime, our primary way of interacting with leaders in society, you know, politicians, um, you know, the monarchy kind of comes within this, I guess, but but they don't really have a primary role in leadership. But 
for those who are in high positions, certainly, our primary role seems to be to criticise um, and to point out where they're wrong. Um, now, this is very, very difficult, isn't it? Because Paul is speaking to Timothy um, in a context whereby they were significantly persecuted for their faith. You know, Paul um, writes numerous of his letters from prison. Um, when he talks about Hymenius and Alexander being shipwrecked for their faith, um, he knows what he's talking about because he's been actually shipwrecked <laughs> um, by, by tough circumstances. That's a natural thing, but he's experienced huge amounts of also um, personal, not, not natural circumstances, but personal persecution. Um, and yet, he says, we still need to pray for kings and all who are in high positions. You know, these are the kings who had rejected Paul, who had uh, schemed um, for his persecution. Uh, these are the people who, had, who were persecuting all the Christians around them. But Paul says, we need to pray for them. Now, it's really interesting because Christians, if you're a Christian, you're called to pray for those who are in leadership within your country, in your society, in your environment. Um, now, why are you called to pray for them? This is, again, where we've got to pay attention because we assume that we're supposed to pray for them so that they would get fixed. <laughs> and so that somehow these people who we are you know, deeply suspicious of and sometimes just downright don't like um, would get it right. And that's what we think it should be the purpose of our prayer. What does Paul say is the purpose of the prayer? He says, pray for them that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's surprising. You pray for all people, and there it is, all people to be saved. We've said that already. You pray for the leaders so that you, as a Christian, can live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. God throws back the possibility upon you. We've said already that he saved you so that he can show patience to you and mercy so that others, through your life, can understand the truth of the gospel. You know, through tough times and bad, even, you know, and please God, this isn't the case for us, but even should we have to be kind of you know the consequence of our sin, the shipwreck of our faith, it's so that we can be restored and God can do good things again through us for the good of others. And it, we're called here to pray for those in authority so that we can live those godly and dignified lives, bringing others to the understanding of, of what it is to know and love Jesus. Pay attention. Pay attention. It's not always as you assume. It's not always um, coming from where you think it is or going to where you think it is. God has purposes. He is sovereign. And God has saved you with a good and gracious reason. He wants to do good things through your life with good and gracious reason, even through your correction and discipline. Um, and God wants to do good things through your prayer, even though uh, it might not be the way that you would like. Are we, are we, are we wrestling at the moment? When we see, you know, the president of the United States and the, you know, British authorities as well, pulling out of Afghanistan, and the the, the horrific consequences that are there, how you're praying about these things, um, but should you be praying, um, saying, oh God, would you fix Boris, fix President Biden, they're terrible people who've done terrible things, or you to be praying, God, would you enable um, your people, the believers to have peace and to have quiet lives, to be able to live godly and dignified lives in every way. You know, we can even extend this prayer, can't we? You know, there's, there's a temptation, isn't there, to pray. I don't know, I don't know about you, but there's a temptation to pray those imprecatory psalms, the, you know, the judgment of heaven upon the heads of, of, of perhaps people like the, the Taliban, for instance. Um, but perhaps our prayers would be better, such that God, would you restrain the hand of wickedness so that our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan may also be able to live peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. May they know the blessings that we know in this. God, protect and preserve them. Lord Jesus, grant them your grace so that through them many more may come to faith in that place. Jesus, in you. 
pay attention. Pay attention. The world is very, very complicated. Um, there are many, many troubling things. But here is the truth. Verse 5. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Come on, shall we pray together? Lord Jesus, we come to pray to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. And we pray, God, to you be honour and glory for ever and ever. Lord Jesus Christ, transform our perspectives. Lord Jesus Christ, would you tune and focus our prayers. Lord Jesus, would you even be at work upon our person so that your presence, um, demonstrated yet more fully through us, Lord God, might bring peace. Yes, God, we do pray peace, Lord Jesus Christ, for our brothers and sisters who find themselves in, in such incredibly uh, devastatingly troubling circumstances. In Afghanistan, certainly, in so many places around the world. But Lord Jesus Christ, we pray also that we, Lord God, would be willing also to let you discipline us to peace, to godliness, to um, living these holy lives that you call us to. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you in all of these things. And I hope you've been chatting along with one another. Um, do please get in touch if there's anything you'd like to chat about in more detail. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, good night and God bless.